Well, welcome everyone to the last program in the library series, a special evening with, and this is a really special one. I'm so excited to have Robert Hundley here with his part of his tremendous collection of garments. Uh, I'm Alice Cooper, the director of the library, and uh, we've had a wonderful summer of program programming for all ages. It's pretty much ending this week, except next Friday at 3.30, we have bingo. So, <laughs> it's lots of fun. It lasts only one hour, and you too can have a chance to win a prize from Dollar Tree. <laughs> it's good fun for the community. Um, so, I think a lot of you do know Robert. Uh, he lives in Heathsville. I had a career in the Army, grew up here, part of a very large family, and um, has spent his time collecting and creating historical garments. So without further, oh, and I would like to also mention that this program is co-sponsored with the Lancaster, Virginia Historical Society, and Karen Hart, the executive director, I'm sure will be here until Mrs. Carroll She was here. She's, she's doing an elevator. Oh, she's doing yeah. it. Okay, well, thank you. All right. Happy to be here. I was telling Alice, I wrote an outline, threw it away, wrote another one, threw it away. So I decided that I'm going to try to stick to a line. Uh, a lot of you that know me, I very easily can go off on a tangent, but um, I did my first reenactment, um, I guess it was 1980, 81, shoot, when was that? No, it was earlier than that because uh, I was still in high school and uh, they had an event in Heastville and then later the Revolutionary War group that was there, I fell in with them at Yorktown for the event there for the Bicentennial. So that was my first chance. Um, when I was in college, I got a chance to spend the weekend at Sailor's Creek, dressed out, 
uh, Sailor's Creek is where my great-great-grandfather was uh, part of the group that surrendered that was supporting Lee's retreat. And he ended up at Point Lookout, Maryland, and didn't get released until June of 1865. And luckily, I have his discharge, copy of his discharge papers, and very tall man, you know, of course, a dark, dark complexion and all that fun stuff. Well, he was living on the beach with hardly any shade, so you can imagine. But the fact that he ended up straight across the creek when he was living in Amherst area, Nelson and Amherst County is where my mom's side of the family is from. So I started collecting, I guess my mom was kind of part of that fault, um, but she, she had stuff that was families and, and I acquired stuff, uh, helped some people make some things. And when I started reenacting in earnest, I realized very quickly, it's not cheap. <laughs> and then when you go out and do, uh, just buy cloth, buy the buttons, you know, you're looking at 30, 35, 45, $55 a yard. And you know, some of these outfits are a lot of yards. And then I started learning a little bit about when you make an outfit. Now, a costume, um, a costume is like this outfit here. Now, my granddaughter Sawyer back here, she's six, and this was mine <laughs> when I was six. <laughs> so, and my, you know mom made. So uh, I think if I remember right, I was supposed to be a cat. But it was for <laughs> Halloween. And uh, so many years ago. And as you go to different events and things, you learn and make things and do different things. So when Alice asked me to talk about costuming, I told her that in the living history, reenacting, docenting world, that's a dirty word. It isn't a costume. It's period correct clothing. And if you're correct enough, then you have clothes that fill, fill the purpose of what you're doing. And if you get too close to the campfire, it doesn't leave you. Now, I was at an event sitting almost on the ground. I was on a log holding a, I guess she was three, maybe four month old baby girl. Her mother was on the other side of the campfire fixing lunch. And I had injured my ankle uh, at the army base uh, during training. So her husband and everybody else from my reenacting unit were across the little open area doing drill, you know, military, even reenacting. You got to do a certain amount of drill so you can put on a good presentation. So she leans over to stir, and she had just been telling me how proud she was of this dress she had just finished that she was wearing. And beautiful dress. She didn't check that the cloth was a blend when she made it. So it was polyester base. Oh. So you can imagine what happened when, when the edge caught fire. So it was a four panel skirt, very much like the black checked one back there is, which was normal from the period. You do night pleats around the top, do a nice band, like what Jennifer's wearing over here. And then when the bottom got all messed up, You'd open the pleats up, take the band off, flip it over, redo it, and get some more use out of it. And so the center panel instantaneous disappeared. Uh, luckily, she had all of the undergarments 
in pure cotton that she should have been wearing. And so her pantaloons, her uh, underskirt, petticoat, overskirt, over her uh, everything that she, you would normally wear underneath of a regular skirt were of cotton and of natural fabric. So, uh, you know, later she redid it. And uh, during that time period and even the periods before, um, there were two things that were the main killers of women all around the world. <coughs> childbirth and cooking and cooking is because most cooking was done on an open hearth and you're walking around amongst the coals trying to do and, and a lot of women actually had pure wool aprons that they would soak in a bucket put it on and then go cook to keep from catching it hurt get hurting themselves so this particular coat um, is one I made. Uh, it's a Columbus Depot. So I was reenacting for a number of years uh, with the Army of Tennessee out in um, Tennessee, Kentucky, in that part of the country. I was stationed at Fort Campbell at the time. So this particular one, um, I cut everything out, put it in a bag, all my thread and needles and buttons and everything and we left to go on a week's worth of maneuvers and <clears throat> I sew, it's all hand sewn I sewed it all while we were there and the last day when I was making this now this pocket wasn't normal for a depot coat men usually either paid somebody or would add this so they could keep their fixings in it, as they called it, which was a bag of tobacco and their rolling paper. Um, it works really good for a bag to change and stuff in it. It's the same effect, and usually they'd have a coin or something hanging outside to um, that was tied to it to keep the cord available so you weren't digging for it. So I was working on the coat and I was finishing up one of the last buttonholes, hand stitching them, and I could feel somebody watching me. So I finished the thing and look up. There's probably 60 people standing there looking at me. And we were probably, I don't know, at least 400 yards or more in our little tent area where we were doing our class from everybody else. So I was like, you know, did I miss a class? <laughs> you know, that I was supposed to be teaching. And they said, um, no. Word circulated that you're about finished. <laughs> and hospital commander. Colonel, Sergeant Major, two company commanders, two first sergeants, and a whole bunch of other people from the unit. So I had to get up, put it on, show it to them, let them look at it, explain to them what a Columbus Depot jacket was, and Columbus, Georgia is where the depot was. And dark blue was the color of infantry in the west, where light blue was the color of infantry in the east, Usually, you know, most of the time the guys and jean cloth was pretty much the fabric, it wasn't gray wool. And je what jean cloth is, is it's cotton this way and wool this way. But also they made jean cloth using uh, linen, using um, other fabrics, but usually wool and cotton because it made it a little bit more airy a little bit lighter, but still kept you warm. And this was your only, some cases, the only way to keep warm. So you had this one. So this one's hand stitched. Now think about the fact, I'm working on a movie set and I've spent weeks putting me together a perfect interpretation of an outfit. 
and then they and then they say all right did you make two like we asked you to and you said yes and you show them the two for whatever the particular actor is they take one walk over to a cement mixer full of rocks <laughs> and throw it into it because it has to look tore up now in the movie pirates of the caribbean when the ship went into ghost mode that was the same outfit made at the same time that the pirates as ghosts were wearing but they had been thrown into cement mixers full of rocks to tear them up so this particular one unfortunately has had a couple places where the nice wool liking moths have decided they liked it too but it still very works very well very comfortable now when you're doing a costume or a period correct clothing or whatever you're doing you got to check on not only what you're doing but where it's being put to so i did civil war reenacting for years or war between the states both in the east and in the west a lot less politics in the West. But um, at the Battle of First Manassas, more Southerners were wearing blue coats and light blue pants than Northerners. And all of the New York units were dressed in gray from head to toe. So you add to that the first national flag, the Stars and Stripes, which was what, 34, 35 stars. Um, no wind, a little bit of moisture in the air, and a lot of smoke. And that was one of the reasons why Jackson's men were able to walk right up to a uh, Union unit at the Battle of First Manassas, <coughs> be on their flank, and basically obliterate them because they thought there were more of their own guys coming up. And, uh, you know, when the flag didn't fly, nobody knows what it looks like. That's one of the reasons why they developed the St. Andrew's Cross, the flag that a lot of people call the Confederate flag, even though it was never an official Confederate flag. It was called the battle flag, only if the general officer accepted it as their unit's flag. Most general officers, especially in the West, they had their own flag. Lee had his own flag that he kept with him. It was called the Ark of the Covenant. So back to costuming. Other than period correct clothing or making stuff, if you want to wear vintage clothing, especially the ladies. Now the men, it's a lot easier. This frock coat, this was developed roughly 1820, right after the, and it's still in use. I asked a gentleman in Macedonia, Taylor, to make me a tuxedo. Well, this is what he brought me for $120, vest, coat, and pants. Um, so, you know, he, you know, apologized and then later came back and brought me a, a red, white, and black cummerbund with matching bow ties from scraps <laughs> that he had left over but he wasn't hurting too bad because he did me this was considered a three-piece suit and all three-piece suits were 120 dollars so he did this one um three-piece suit and then i had him do this one also, which is basically the same coat, no difference. They just cut the cut it away. That's why it's called a cutaway. So made in the finest Macedonian wool. So you send it to the cleaners again. Um, last time I wore it, I had plastic chains and stuff all over me to go do an event up in West Virginia. But um, so same thing. Did a vest. Of course, the vest that goes with this is only three buttons, and or you would wear a cummerbund. Now, during the time 
this has a little bit of a V to it, but um, that uh, coats in the 1820s, when the cutaways started coming into vogue, uh, they were straight across. They could be buttoned. If any of you have watched, I've only seen a couple of the shows, but I read a little bit about the TV show or the series, was it Brigaton, the new series? Fictional, as in what's going on, but the clothes, everything in the show, they're trying to stick very close to the period of the Regency period, which is the end of the Georgian period, because that was King William. King William was sick, which they kind of allude to in the movie, as or in the show, as the queen is the one really in power because he's ill, and they don't allow a regent to be in power. But the clothing is right. So the period of Jane Austen, you know, Darcy, the dandies, and those type of things. Um, that's also the period when paste jewelry, iron chains for jewelry, and other things started coming into, they got away from precious stones, they got away from uh, gold and silver, and those type of things. They still had it, but they were making things so everybody could wear it, you know, it became more prominent. So that's another thing you got to worry about when you're doing your costumes is what is my jewelry going to be? You know, something happened in 1870 that most people don't think about. And I never thought about it until just recently when I was thinking about the fact a lot of my family never had pierced ears. 1870, it became taboo in Europe and in the United States, especially the eastern part of the United States, to have pierced ears. Now, during the Civil War, it was very prominent. And it really didn't start coming back into vogue, if you think about it, until late 50s, 60s, or later. And so, you know, pierced ears just didn't happen. And um, so if somebody wants to be picky when you have your outfit, you would, um, there are those in the reenacting world who will, you know, walk right up to you, take your shirt, uh, that's 10 stitches to the inch instead of 12, oh, you know, that type of stuff. I mean, they're like that, <laughs> especially in the living historians, sometimes as a docent. Now, as a docent, you want people to get right up close to you. As a reenactor, 10-foot rule is great. <laughs> you know, and usually if you're carrying a musket with a bayonet, they're going to keep away from you. Anyway. And as a cavalry person, you know, 20, 30 feet is great. And in reenacting right now, uh, most cavalry units are complete family affairs. I was at the uh, 145th Gettysburg. I was at the 135th also. Where there was 43,000 reenactors there from all around the world. So if you think about it, Pickett's Charge, originally, there were 15,000 Confederates stepped off. When we stepped off Sunday afternoon, after a half hour cannonade instead of an hour, there were 17,000 of us. The Union troops that were behind the stone wall were six deep. <laughs> not all of them were firing. The first guy was kneeling. The next two were doing proper drill with the musket where you, you know, stand a certain way so they had the band a certain distance. The other three, every now and then switch out, but they'd reach up, take an empty musket, and hand them a loaded one. And they so they could keep firing. And they were so hep on what was going on that my unit that I was part of we were supposed to have been obliterated 
200 yards from the stone wall. And we were almost standing at it when they realized <laughs> that we were there. And we were closer to the crowd. So when they did do the volley and everything, we had to make a, a lot better job of falling. Um, as a reenactor, uh, made a lot of different outfits. Uh, I was telling Alice earlier, um, I made my frock coat when I was first sergeant, then I became sergeant major for my unit. Later, I was lieutenant, and then I became the captain. But when I was captain, I never changed my rank. So this is still lieutenant rank. And if you look, you can still see my uh, first sergeant, sergeant major rank. When I first put this on, when I made it, it just didn't feel right. It was this way and this way. Things were pulled in and just hurt. I was supposed to be at the reenactment that evening. And I had, you know, should I wear it? Shouldn't I wear it? So I wore it. It rained all weekend. I was soaked to the bone most of the time. I mean, I had a full layer of cotton going all the way to the, my ankles, mainly to keep my legs from being worn by the wool and the jean cloth and stuff. By Sunday's battle, everything fit perfect <laughs> because it had been stretched and stretched and stretched jumping up and down doing all the battle scenarios but i've done reenactments where walking across the field i'm on the end of the line with another 12 18 people dressed as a confederate come up to a low spot take a hit, just lay there, change. And then when the Union troops come through, the dozen plus of us stand up on the end of the Union lines. We're supposed to win the battle and come on out and finish the battle as a Union soldier. And the world of reenacting, that's called galvanizing. It's you're allowing yourself to switch sides to better teach the history. I mean, we had hardcore Confederates and hardcore Union that swore up and down they'd never wear one or the other coat. And we had guys as part of our unit, which was part of the deal of being part of the unit, that said, you know, we'll do the battle, but we're not going to galvanize. We'll fall in with somebody else on Sunday. And usually on Sunday's battle, a lot of people would leave, and if it happened to be one where this side or this side was supposed to rein in. And it's kind of hard for a union gr uh, group of union soldiers to prevail the day and look good in front of the crowd when it's 100 of them and 400 of you. <laughs> so I uh, did that a number of times. Now, during the period of Princess Eugenia, now Princess Eugenia was born in Spain. She was a princess who ended up marrying Napoleon III of France. This is later 1840s, early 1850s, where she became Empress Eugenia. Now, there's a, in the center of the table over there, those are original, a lot of them silk, the one, the pink dress and the piece on the top were both made in France somewhere around 1900. And the silk, because it was never cleaned properly, and that's another part of reenacting, is cleaning your garments. Now those two outfits, for me to clean them, I put them on a wooden hanger, button them up, and hang them under a tree in the rainstorm for a day or two. That's how you clean them, because you really can tell usually by smell, if you took your coat to the cleaners and had it clean. And you know, it's just like on a long reenactment, we'd go and get a shower and come back. And you could, well, the same thing happened when I was in the military. If people hadn't bathed in two or three days and then went off and took a shower, you could smell soap 30, 40 yards away as they were walking towards you which was a full bath instead of just a washcloth and doing the necessary spots. 
Uh, this is Princess Eugenia, or Empress Eugenia, sorry. She was close friends with the people on Rue Street in Paris, France, who made a lot of her clothes. So legend has it, they would get together and come up and design, and she loved designing clothes. So Jennifer, you want to stand up a second? This is Princess Eugenia's fault, right here. <laughs> the hoop. And they had hoops. That one's what, like 90? Circumference? Yeah. Yeah, that's about it. So they had 90s, 120, and then a courting hoop was 180 inches. <laughs> now, 180 inches, you think about that. That's twice the size of this. And this is for your daughter who's 15, 16, 17, coming out party and all that kind of stuff. She's dancing, you know, waltzes. You can realize how close they can get together. <laughs> so that was the purpose of the 180 inch hoop. And the hoops were a lot of times were whalebone. And they would take the whalebone and had a way of splitting it in the long, thin pieces to create it. And you could pull the whalebone out to wash the hoop. And they also had a version of a hoop. Thank you. They also had a version of a hoop where they used inch cotton rope. And instead of using the whalebone, they would stitch that in. And it would give you a little bit of fullness so you could work. But ladies of the plantations, <coughs> even in town, they might change three, four times a day. And if you're dressed in a regular outfit, you know, what we would consider work clothes or camp clothes, and you see somebody coming up the red, uh, driveway, and a lot of those driveways were half mile, mile long, you'd run in the house, call anybody you could get, and quickly have them change you. So when you met them at the front door, you were presentable. You looked your best. So Princess Eugenia, um, she deal with the hoop and those type dresses. Now, another thing, during the, um, what they call the Rocco period, which I don't know if any of you have heard of um, Loli, was it Loli Con fashion, which is basically doll fashion, children fashion. But these are people 18, 20, 30 years of age who are dressing up like China dolls. They have frilly dresses, uh, tights, usually rounded toed shoes, and so forth. And it's a big deal. It finally came to the States, to the larger cities, but it started in Japan, China, and over there. Um, get their makeup perfect uh, and everything. And it's a combination of Victorian fashion and the Rocco period. The Rocco period is the period of Marie Antoinette. Well, something that happened during the Rocco period that most people don't realize is uh, Louis the was it 16th, I think. Anyway, the King of France. He had to outlaw certain types of women's fashion in court because two women walking down the hall, they had on a version of a hoop, but it was actually two side bustles that were called hipsters. And two women walking side by side, and you think about a hall this wide, so you have to think about how wide they were. Nobody could get around them. And of course, you weren't gonna be rude and push through them, because that was not very ethical. So, he had to outlaw the hoopster, the hipsters in the in the court. Uh, but the ladies' fashion, the tall hair, uh, that's where the fascinators started coming into play that you see in England and other places, the little small hat. Uh, they would have those tall wigs, some of them so tall where they literally had to walk with two sticks to keep them from flipping over. <laughs> and they would have a little fascinator on their hair 
So when you're doing your doing reenacting and working on your outfit, so say you want to put together an outfit, say for the tavern. All right. The tavern in Heathsville, 1795, is when the pub room was area was built. All right. Um, my way back there, grandfather John Hewlett built the first tavern supposedly on the site somewhere 1660s, 70s time period. Um, and he and John Haney and John Mottram all were pretty much, you know, the landholders in the area. So you're looking on your putting together your outfits. You can go with pictures and paintings and do those type of things. Of course, a lot of writings help. Uh, during the Civil War, uh, war between the states period, there were multiple letters written where people discussed their clothes or asked their wife or their sister to please send two more shirts. I got X amount of dollars for them. The money is enclosed to buy more cloth to get more or send more socks. I got good money for the socks or those type of things. Of course, it kept them going too. I mean, uh, but at the same time, they were sending money home. And, uh, but another thing during the war between the states period that most people don't realize, besides the fact that now we have photography, you know, 1850s, 1840s, a fancy little machine was created that could sew long stitches. So the sewing machine, you know, you could do all these long pieces, then you come back and hand stitch. And of course, that speeded up everything. I uh, read an article that was in the Clarksville, Tennessee newspaper uh, right out in 1861. And it asked all the women in the town to show up at this particular warehouse and bring their sewing machines and um, shoot, not possible. So, uh, what all the, all the women's things that you use, or the, the things you use for sewing? So the devils and the needle of notions. Thank you. <laughs> Told you I got a lot in my head today. So, um, and so they could sew. The cloth was being furnished. The pattern was being furnished, and that's another thing about that period. There were three sizes. They had a small, a medium, and a large. And you just kind of fell in there somewhere in between, if they had your size. If you didn't have your size, you just tried your best. And a lot of them did what I did with that frock coat. They would throw it in a bucket, get it wet, put it on, and try their best to stretch it, because it was wool or jean cloth. They could stretch it out some. Or it would shrink up. Um, so, you know, those things they learned. Uh, most coats were lined in the beginning, but most of the men cut the linings out to use them for cleaning kits or whatever to clean their rifles with, or patch their shirts, patch their pants, and all those type of things. Uh, the, I had a guy, a gentleman I reenacted with for years, and he was so proud of this pants and shirt that he had ordered from a guy who did everything by hand, all hand stitched. And we were down in uh, shoot, Columbus, Georgia, I think it was, just inside of Atlanta, doing an event down there at a, at a park that's where um, the lady who wrote Gone with the Winds Museum is located at her home that she lived in when she visited her grandmother. They cut it in half, moved it from where housing development was going, put it there at the park. And everybody was giving him a hard time because he had new clothes on. You know, and all the rest of us had our older stuff because this was supposed to be Atlanta, you know, latter part of 1864, 1865, you know, that time you know, the burning of Atlanta and all with the wind, which happens to be the set from Hong Kong, I mean, King Kong. 
<laughs> if, if you really look hard and slow it down, you can actually see the big gate and the wall from King Kong, which is what is burning. But um, so we gave him a hard time, a hard time. We did the battle, and we were marching back to go into another scenario. And there was a mud puddle, and he was literally handed somebody his stuff and laid down in the mud puddle and rolled. <laughs> now, if you've ever been to Appomattox, Scottsville area, those that ground is the same ground that's down in that area of Atlanta. That clay doesn't come out. <laughs> oh, no. So I have a pair of pants back there. I think it's in the box back in the back back there. But it still has clay on it that I can't get out from the reenactment at, uh, for the 150th at Appomattox. And uh, so care. Care of your stuff after you make it. Biggest thing is first make sure you do what is proper to the period you're working with as far as cloth, as far as your buttons, as far as you know just everything. I have a wonderful vest and coat, I mean vest and pants I bought from a gentleman who bought them, wore them once. Um, the guy lent him the coat to go with the fancy outfit back there, Colonial. And I haven't decided what, I, what color I'm going to cover the buttons with, but um, whatever I do for the coat is what I'm going to do the buttons, because he used pewter buttons. And they just stick up like a sword bone. <laughs> but he had a coat on and he wasn't carrying you know, some event up at Mount Vernon that he was supposed to go to. So during the Victorian period, chokers were the big thing for women. And cameos was everywhere. Jennifer's got one on. Um, I picked up a bunch overseas. Um, and the biggest place where they were made, I mean, some were double women. Some were single, some were, it didn't always have to have a picture of a lady on it for a cameo. Uh, some had horses and other scenes, and other types of cameos were actually painted. And a lot of those came out of France, but most cameos were made in Northern Italy. Uh, there's a, I can't remember the name of the town, but it's just outside of uh, uh, the narrow the Air Force Base in Northern Italy up there. Uh, I landed there one time coming back for a short layover and there was probably 30 women in the terminal, some dragging their husbands and children, but they had taken a hop solely to that Air Force Base so they could go shopping for cameos. Uh, pearls was a big thing. Uh, all sizes, all types, of course, the better the pearl, the better they liked it. But there in the 20s, you know, a couple of things around your neck and pearls were hanging way down your back uh, was was one of the big deals, it was, you know, the, what, the flapper period. Um, the And then you get into the next world. Girls there in the 1850s into the 60s started rebelling. Um, women would wear shorter skirts with pants, change their pantaloons. They'd wear mitts instead of gloves. Their hands are still covered, but they'd rather have a mitt on. And the mitt, of course, exposed to fingers, which allowed better dexterity, but if you were of courting age, you weren't supposed to be touching anybody. <laughs> so it, it was a big thing. Now, as an example, now men also with civilian clothes to a point, but women even more so in, let's say you were 50 years of age in 1860. What influenced your dress in 1860 
is what was in fashion when you were 18. About the time you would thought of getting married. That would have set your style, would have set, of course there was always the dandies and the ones who always were trying to be frilly and doing those type things, but the that's how things set. So like Benjamin Franklin, now, granted he was quite eccentric and he did a lot of his stuff on purpose, like wearing the fur hat the whole time he was in France so people would notice him. But if you notice, he never wore a short vest. His vest was always the longer one. And it wasn't even the one from the French and Indian Wars. Usually it was a little longer than that, which would have been 1740s time period instead of 1750s to 60s. Now, as a reenactor, ladies or men, uh, moisture is bad for your stuff, but a lot of people don't think about it, and they're putting their stuff away, and they reach in the closet, and they grab a hanger, and they put their stuff on this. And they, they rust, sticks to it, messes it up. You know, this, this is better. This is great. Of course, the ones that are really wide are even better because for the shoulders. But the other things that you don't think about is straight pins, safety pins. And I always have a handful of safety pins in my bag. Not so much for me, but, you know, multiple times somebody's skirt or something will come loose or it's ga gapping on the side and you, you can come in and do something to at least make it look a little better. Um, but then you forget to take them out. <laughs> so, you know, that that's also creates rust spots, causes breakdown of the cloth. Um, the pink outfit over here. Now, when I acquired this, these clothes were wrapped up inside of it, so I'm pretty sure that everything was for the same young lady. Her name is written on it. I can't, um, my daughter tried to read it. We can, we can understand. The first name we think is Jenny, but we can't read the last name. So her underpants. Her pantaloons with her name on it. And her, uh, I guess, chemise or top there. I'm pretty sure this was her top that was in there also. And the thing I like about it is not so much that it's just simple cotton, but you look at the sleeves, and if you get a chance a little bit, how much needlework was done create these cuffs and of course their mother of pearl and colors that's another thing colors from different periods red was very hard to come by red in the colonies and red even up into the 1840s and 50s came from a beetle out in New Mexico Arizona area that they would capture crush it up boil it and that released this dye in its shell that they could use dye and cloth and stuff to get the red so it was expensive uh blues blacks you know indigo was raised was created in the colonies heavily um at you know we think of jean uh jean cloth but most people don't realize now these are a modern pair of kind of dressy blue jeans but what most people don't think about this is exactly what the jean cloth would have been like as in blue jean cloth of the 49ers during the gold rush time when levi decided to quit making tents 
and started making pants for the gold miners. Same thickness and everything. So every now and then you'll see reenactors wearing what you think are blue jeans, but they're not. They, they literally look like this. But these are modern ones, but it still it looks the same way. They're thinner, they're not as thick as regular jean. Uh, it's more of a heavy canvas. That has been indigo, and the indigo partly was used in the tent making process to keep the bugs from eating the, the cotton. You know, so as you acquire stuff, you come across some fun things. So, like this coat, actually all three of these coats. Oh, they're sleeping. I was going to get them to help me hold them up. Um, these came off the set of the Alamo with John Wayne. All three of these coats. So, I acquired five word got out a gentleman with me was able to get six and by the time they opened the place there was probably 200 people waiting to go in and stand over here and hold this for me can you hold it or put it on turn it around <laughs> this that's mess missing the epaulets mexican drummer boy at the alamo is what would have worn this Looks very much like a Civil War cavalry tunic from the same period. So, what's fun is on the inside, hold it. It's got the name, guy's name and all in there from when it was made. But see these? It's got snaps, it's got huge hook and eyes. The buttons could be buttoned. But they don't have any real use. And because it was such a distance, they got modern day or 1840s, 50s Navy buttons on there. <laughs> They're Navy buttons. <laughs> now, this one, I haven't been able to find. The guy told me it came off the same set. It should have had epaulets. It's gold bullion uh, trim, heavy metal trim, just like these are. This one is. And this is more naval. If you look at a picture of Robert E. Lee as a lieutenant, same cut style and everything. Uh, I wore this a couple years ago at Elizabeth Miller's in Reedville when she was doing the Christmas tour thing. I wore white pants and had my sash and took a shako and set it up to. So I could be a, you know, I guess, tin soldier or whatever. <laughs> now, this one, I don't think it was Fork Union Academy, but it was one of Virginia academies is where the coat came from. My aunt acquired this in 1961 for my cousin. And I wore it for years myself until I got some better stuff. And eventually the wool looked so bad that a friend of mine put the blue, light blue cotton on there, which was also on some of the clothes. But he wanted to be able to fall in at Manassas for the 100th anniversary of Manassas. So she made it. And he fell in with the unit at, at 16 years of age. So. And it's just basic wool, but like I said, it came from one of the Virginia military academies. Um, and these, I actually got these in 79, I guess it was. And as you can see, well worn, <laughs> light blue. I wore them with, well, it didn't matter what type coat. And I had them one time sitting on the table when I had come home and mom made some comment about them and I didn't think any more about it. And when I came back, she <laughs> lined them. <laughs> so now I did and usually do uh, when I'm wearing wool pants reenacting. 
an absorbable pair of lightweight, 100% cotton sleep bands, which is what men's underwear was during that period. They had drawstrings on the at the ankles and drawstrings around the waist. Don't you look cute? <laughs> and um, so, you know, so you basically like the sleeves on this shirt. Now this shirt is one I made for Civil War, Rev War, or whatever, but it would work just fine. And it was one of my first endeavors uh, at Jamestown. Okay. Um, there's no buttons, nothing on that. It's just the drawstrings. Now the Avery, let's change coats. Let's change coats. This coat, wait a minute, trying to get it down. There you go. <laughs> this coat is perfect for um, Jamestown or all the way up into the early 1800s. It was a workman's coat where you could come in, untie the sleeves, and now you have the vest. Oh. A lot of sailors had these for a couple of hundred years. Um, the other thing that people had was, uh, you know, you think about pants from the period. And everybody thinks Revolutionary War, pretty much everybody wore, um, what did I do with them? Um, but everybody wore the short pants, you know, like boys, they're out of short pants now. Well, now you're two, three years of age. Most boys wore dresses anyway. But workers, farmers, craftsmen, they had long pants just like I'm wearing as early as the you know, 1730s and 40s. And sailors, they wore what they called slops. And they were down the mid-calf. Looked more like the skirt, but uh, you know, that was so they could run around, get up and down the mast. But um, it's funny, during the Revolutionary War, um, Avery, come here a second. See the green checked skirt back there on the table? There's two of them, same size. Go get both of those for me. Um, during the Revolutionary War, which at the beginning of the U.S. Navy, uh, if, if any of you have been in the Navy, well, that's the kilt, these two. This one's mine. <laughs> these happen to be, um, these are my family tartans, but they're girls ones. Uh, this is the actual tartan, and this is the dress. And this is also dress. This is the Gordons, which is from the Hunley clan. It's a sept of them. So um, I'll go back to them in a second. Um, so when the Navy was started in 1775, that was why you notice Coast Guard and Navy dress pants that have the flap. Mm -hmm. There's 13 buttons. All right, that goes back to them. <coughs> Men's pants of the time were the, of the British style, and they had the flaps. And, uh, oh, there they are. So, very much like this, with the flap in the front. Of course, it didn't have 13 buttons, but you, were, you had a button, a button, and a button. And then usually this was two or three buttons to hold it together at the waist. Of course, this was open so you could do your business. 
and buttons here, so it would be below your knees. Above your knee was a strap uh, like this one to hold your socks up. Guard. And if you you very quickly realize that you have it too tight. Well, because of the American Revolution, these went out of vogue. And what they referred to as the French fly came into fashion, which was basically a straight button fly. By the War of 1812, when we were fighting with the British again, a lot of people were back to wearing that, that type of style because it gave you a flat front for these type coats. You know, you, you wanted to have, you, they would embroider, because this was, your waist was here, you know, at least two to three inches above your belly button, and your vest was here, you had all this nice area that could be embroidered. So they, a lot of them had embroidered fronts. And uh, careful of those. <laughs> So, these are amber, real amber, and um, I bought these in uh, Bulgaria from a lady, and I was talking to her, and she said, I said, why they feel awful light? She said, they're real amber, real amber. She reached in her pocket, pulled out a lighter, and started to show me, and one of them actually has where the lighter hit it but uh, the impurities and things that are in them. And then the, now this, no, yeah, this one is a correct to the period amber brooch from probably the 1850s. Um, you can tell by the class, but it also could be used as a necklace. Um, and then this one um, has actually had a cameo engraved in the back of it. So, and the same lady that sold me these convinced me to buy the amber pierced earrings to go with it. But, uh, and one of these days, I keep telling my daughter, so I'm just going to turn them loose with boxes of, <laughs> lots of boxes of jewelry. <laughs> Not counting the three boxes of stuff to make jewelry with. But um, so the things that go with your outfit is as important as the cloth and how you make it and how you take care of it, you know, how you wash it. Um, that beautiful dress is falling apart because of body oils being left on it and when it's cleaned and when properly cared for. Um, this, Alice and I were looking at this earlier, I, I think pretty sure it probably started life possibly maybe as a, as a, um, tablecloth, but it was used as a shawl and not clean. And one of the reasons you know is you can see where the body holes from the shoulders were. And it's silk. It's got some awful long tassels. And the tassels are actually knitted. They did them like you would do in a regular net and then made the tassel part off them. I mean, this thing probably weighs five pounds or more by itself. Um, another big thing of the period. If you ever see pictures of Robert E. Lee, he always has a gray hat. Now, this one happens to be a lady's, but it could be easily be turned back into a man's. Most people don't realize the fact his hat, the rim is turned up, just like this. All right, feathers were a big thing. They had whole companies that would do feathers. And uh, here, Avery, hold this one. Hold that one. Now these, this is a pheasant, and I think that's a, uh, possibly a peacock that's been dyed. Of course, 
hen's feathers. They would die on every color under the sun. The longer the feather and how many feathers meant how prosperous you were. You know, uh, one of the terms in the in Scottish history is what was it used the uh, cock of the of the moor or cock of the of the of the area, meaning he was the most prominent person. And I met a lady <laughs> several years ago who she had three pheasant feathers in her uh, in Gary that she was wearing. And I asked her about it, and she said, well, I'm the clan chief now. And now think of a woman like 6'2", six 6'3", six in height, with two foot tall feathers <laughs> you know, sticking on top of her head. So prominent. Victorian top. The only thing that most ladies don't like about it is it's got a lot of buttons. <laughs> but it's got always had a brooch holding the top together. You could adjust your top a little bit by the brooch, open it up a little bit more. And like everything else, they liked their tassels. They liked their tassels. So here, uh, a lady made this, and then uh, my former wife and I added these tassels and stuff to it. And of course, here's the dress or the skirt that goes with it. So this skirt with this top and that shirt or one similar, and the. Um, so as you acquire things, uh, like I said earlier, care is important. Storage is important. I had some outfits given to me. I mean, they're beautiful. They gave them to me because they had been left hanging in a closet. They had a window. And um, Isn't that pretty? So, and this one's not so bad. It must have been farther down the line. But you can still see a little bit on this one. So this, these are the tops. Here's the skirt. And you can see it at the bottom on that one. And oh, the pants are inside. <laughs> Same thing with the pants. So I always thought the cloth is perfect. If there was a way to match the dye and fill in those spots, I mean, just a wonderful outfit. And it buttons here, and it buttons up on the side here. So taking care of your stuff is very important. If you've been out reenacting, and you take off your shoes, they're usually wet, if not from sweat or anything, you need to remember to put these on. And I don't care if you're a man, woman, or whatever. you got to have some sort of inserts, even if it's just shoving newspaper trying to type. And the same thing with your hat. Now, this is an original hat jack. And this is a hat jack that came from one of the most expensive, but one of the best reenacting re hat makers in the world, probably outside of maybe England and France. And there's one up in Canada. And this is Dirty Billy's out of Gettysburg. And he thinks highly of this stuff. That's one of the reasons why I learned very quickly how to uh, 
make things and remake things. There's a hat back there on the table that I gave a guy $30 for last weekend, and he had bought it at a yard sale, reworked it, put stiffening in it. And next to it are two hats, or I think one hat, the other one's in the box, that I bought at a yard sale for 50 cents a piece. And one of them is very similar to the hat. So the one my granddaughter's wearing is the one I got at the market fair in West um, in Western Maryland. And I would have been wearing that in the picture if I had had it. I got that two weeks after the picture was taken to go with that suit. And um, so care and being able to keep stuff from going away. Now, speaking of hats, It's a real hat. It's not a it's Halloween prop. It's not for Frosty in your front yard. <laughs> it's a real hat. Um, has a pocket inside to put your gloves in. You would wear it to the opera. Because of what it's made of, it would keep your head dry. Then when you got to wherever you were going, the show or whatever, you put your gloves in and sit on it. <laughs> and when you got up, so. What is it made of? Uh, this one is like a version of rayon, okay. you know, which was coming into vogue in the early 1900s. Um, I've seen some similar uh, that had a silk pillow the most of the silk ones have just gone to pieces. And uh, uh, this is a vest that we think, we're pretty sure the lady I got it from, um, I'm pretty sure it was from 1820s to 30s, um, which would make sense because of the flat bottom and all. But as you can see on the back, see how the ties are. You would put it on, button it, and then get somebody else, just like with a corset, to tie them to make sure the front was a straight line. And men wore corsets. Don't let anybody kid you. <laughs> they had corsets, they wore them. Um, and of course, ties. I wouldn't wear this in the 1850s, <laughs> but if I was doing something from the 1970s, yeah, yeah, right. mm -hmm. you know, my leisure suit, I'd be, <laughs> there you go. Now granted, oh I knew the lady who used to wear this, but I also knew some guys who had the same tie <laughs> yeah. I was wearing. So, you know, that, your pants, your vest, your coats, needs to be right but your gloves and if this thing gets any fuller i don't know what i'm gonna do but i'm constantly getting more gloves but um ladies gloves lace gloves uh, jennifer's got several pair of different types got a couple with the glovelet yeah the mitts yeah which are fingerless um but you would have these for like going out and doing something special. Now, these gloves were probably very heavily possibly used with oh here's my pants from Gettysburg. I come in Appomattox that I can't get clean. Oh. Virginia mud. And it was muddy. But now this little lady here, I'm sure all of you have seen the new version of Alice in Wonderland. You know, then there's Alice through the looking glass. The garden party that she came back to, everybody's in white. And that was very prominent, especially in New England and Europe and in the 1890s. This is a complete young lady's out that this thing has a big stand and all and it weighs a ton so i'm lazy um, 
but I helped her make it, and then she gave this to me along with her Eliza Doolittle outfit, which is probably a size one. Um, but uh, Bev was a big part of the tavern, so she made this and this, and like I said, I helped her. And then the outfit that's on the two chairs in the back is a Renaissance outfit that has never been finished. It was on a mannequin, and I took it off the mannequin and I pinned it. But if you did the Eliza Doolittle outfit, of course, this would be more prominent hat. And don't let people say that women were defenseless at that time period. So, matter of fact, I was telling, I think Alice earlier, a lot of women, when they had their corsets made, they would have a thin sleeve placed into them, and they would get something that was similar to spring steel and make a little something similar to this, but a little heavier, and it would slide into the corset into that sleeve to use as a weapon. So, somebody got too touchy feely, I guess. They, now, this is the reproduction made in the early 2000s. This is an original 1890s. Um, unfortunately, same like in a lot of stuff I've acquired, given to me or whatever. Silk, beautiful, but it's disintegrating. So it's great for creating and making other things. Um, you know, autumn. I can get the plastic cap open. Here, turn around. So it is the same, but it's just a little short cake. You think about this cake with that outfit, you know, Eliza Dulo type outfit. Um, so The only thing that this outfit might have been missing if you added the cape, plus the hat, would be the gloves. So with the long sleeves, short gloves. If you were doing, um, you know, breakfast at Tiffany's, um, of course, sleeves all the way up to here because it's a sleeveless type dress. Um, so they go up and down. I never realized how many gloves some ladies would have over the years and uh, I have another box similar to this at home and uh, people you know no, nobody really wants them but um, and um, the direct the black dress that's back there that's checked um, that I helped make. It has what they call pagoda sleeves. So a pagoda sleeve would, now this is actually a, a glove, fingerless, but it would be basically the same thing. You would take a shirt in whatever color you want it, cut the sleeve off, put a draw string in the end up here, and it's up underneath the pagoda sleeves, and then you had sleeves. Or you wear various types of gloves. But this was another way to do your opera gloves without having to worry about buttons, I mean, uh, fingers. It was more like a mitt. Robert. Okay. I know. I know. Yeah. <laughs> so, anybody have any good, good questions, bad questions? I can always make up a good answer. So. Have you always been doing collecting? Oh, uh, it kind of fell on me. I have people giving me things, and I'm almost, I've gotten almost as bad as some of the ladies that I talked to at the quilt guild at the tavern <laughs> when it comes to cloth. I was looking for some stuff earlier, and I had to move probably 25 bolts 
on bolts of cloth on tubes to get to them. And some of them are wonderful 1970s designs. Several of them are, what do they call them? Unfinished quilts, where the quilt is there, rolled up on the tube with no backing on them. And that's another thing about a quilt. If you're thinking about a period that you want to work with, if you can find a quilt that's been dated, which quilt, dating a quilt is whatever's the newest fabric in the quilt, most people think. Or, I mean, I have one quilt that my cousin made, and inside of it's another quilt that's a lot older. And she, this was probably made in 1910 when she was a little girl. So, yes, re recycled. <laughs> so as things came to me, then I tried to try to figure out ways to preserve them. The largest collection in the state of Virginia between the three museums in Richmond is the University of Virginia. The tens of thousands of clothing pieces for their theater part. And uh, I know some people that have actually seen it and told me about it and that I've read about it. And I'm not near that bad, but. <laughs> and, you know, and what do you do with it once you have it? <coughs> something like this. Use it as inspiration to try to create something similar. Um, you know, I've got a World War II uniform that I acquired recently that actually fits me uh, with my staff sergeant's rank on it. Um, I might wear it, might not wear it, I don't know, but it does fit. Now all I got to do is think about some of the other stuff that go with it. Um, if you're trying to create something, you know, are, am I going to use it? Or is it just going to sit? Or for pocket money, I made lots of on the steamboat jackets for guys that are reenacting with. And, uh, but now I've got cases and cases where we think we're puffer or we made containers full of cloth. I went to a cloth place in Kuwait City, six square blocks of nothing but cloth suits. And most of them were no bigger from here to that wall and from this wall to here, stacked side by side by side. You go in one and they only one type of silk, only one type of sheer, one type of wool. I've been holding on to a piece of linen that I bought in 2000 that was block printed on pure linen and a mill in India that has been in operation for over 300 years and made the same way that they were making it 300 years ago. It'd be wonderful for a colonial woman's outfit. And when I was buying it, you know, equivalent of $5 a yard per meter, I got nine meters. <laughs> so, anyway. So any other questions, comments, feel free to look and ask questions on what's hanging out. And uh, I don't think Alice is going to kick me out in the next five minutes. <laughs> it, it might take you that long to pack up. <laughs> it, it goes back in the boxes a lot faster because I was trying to organize. And uh, look at my, I'm sure you all played the operation game. That is oh, my that. Halloween costume that I made for myself <laughs> several years ago. And actually wore, I have a red nose and the whole nine years. <laughs> well, thank you, Rob. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I don't care where it's me, wool is hot. <laughs>